Um, I did want to talk a little bit about the Alliance because I understand that as part of Envision, um, let's see, is this working? Not quite? We're going to get it there in a second. Isaiah's got me. Okay. We're part of Envision, and that's part of the Alliance, but I'm just curious. Raise your hand if you've heard of Envision before. Okay, some of you. Okay, many of you. Awesome. That's great. If you could flip me to the slide with the different, there we go, okay. Awesome. There we go, yeah, right there. That's good, thank you. I just wanted to, to talk to you just a little bit at the beginning of this about the great family of missions that you guys are a part of. I wanted to thank you for being part of that. Many of you have probably heard of um, access or the IWs, international workers that go around the world planting churches. Uh, maybe you've heard of some of the doctors or dentists or teachers that go into countries where it's really difficult to get into as a Christian and they uh, do their tent making, their, their job, and in an effort to then create relationship with locals and, and talk to Jesus, talk about Jesus with people that way. And then there's the comma side of, the thing, of things. Maybe you've heard part of our story where we were going to Ukraine. Is it working now? Great. Um, we were going to Ukraine and we couldn't because there is a war. And comma would be the group that will go in eventually um, and help to rebuild, help to um, rebuild churches, rebuild buildings of other types and schools and things like that. They provide relief um, and development of places uh, that have been war-torn or, or gone through different natural disasters. And then there's Envision. And Envision is all about leadership development, developing young missional leaders. And in fact, our, our mission statement is here. Envision is here to identify and develop missional leaders through short-term missions, opportunities, and innovative ministry strategies. And so our goal is to help young leaders in the church launch into this missional life, whether that be right here in your local context or internationally away from their home culture. And so today, I'm going to go back a couple slides. I want to talk to you a little bit about questionable living. <laughs> that might, might seem kind of weird for me to be talking about questionable, questionable living. What does that mean? And I, I mean it very literally. Living that invokes questions from people. For instance, I worked with a colleague in Berlin. This man, perhaps you know him, his name's Mike Piccinato, he's from this beautiful state originally. But in Berlin, he wears his facial hair, very specifically. He has a mustache that goes like this. It's very impressive. And he does this for a reason. It's part of his way of living a questionable life, right? Similarly, this man in his uh, mid-40s, he'd been a pastor before, became a missionary, is now living in Berlin, and he decides to go get a sleeve, a full sleeve of tattoos. It's a beautiful tattoo. They're stained glass windows with symbols that tell the gospel story in that glass, stained glass window sleeve. Again, why? Well, he wants to be living a life that evokes questions, that gets people asking, why do you do what you do? What are you doing? Why? What? All the questions. That's what he's aiming for in order to start conversations, gospel-centered conversations. And so we did this too as Envision in Taiwan. This was the first place we went to in 2015, and we were in um, Taiwan for six years, and that meant that we identified those missional leaders as they walked into our coffee shop. We called it the aroma, okay? And this coffee shop, having that coffee shop meant that we actually needed to be able to serve coffee, <laughs> right? Prior to moving to Taiwan, I didn't drink coffee. I do now, <laughs> and one of the reasons is because, okay, if you're going to be part of this coffee shop ministry, you better know a little bit about coffee, right? Makes sense. But not only did we need to know a little bit about coffee, but we also needed to find a way to surprise the world around us because you see, right next to us, just next door, was another coffee shop. Down the street, there were two Starbucks. 
So the fact that we had a coffee shop was nothing questionable at all. In fact, young people in Taiwan, they see the movies, they see Western culture, and coffee culture similarly has made its way to Asia, and it's an in thing, it's popular. It's uh, seen as a status symbol if you can be walking around with a cup of Starbucks. And so we needed to do something different. What did we do? We gave away free English lessons. And our teachers were all Christians, and they would spend Friday nights, Friday nights of all nights, teaching English to young Taiwanese who, who wanted to learn a little bit of English either to get ahead in, in their job, in business, or maybe they wanted to be able to travel outside of the island, get out. And so English was one of the ways that they did that. And our teachers would spend time teaching them English on Friday nights, but also on the weekends as well. You see, our teachers didn't just stay there during the lesson, but oftentimes they would invite students out to go hiking on the weekend or, or out to a restaurant or to a no different coffee shop. And in that way, they were living questionable lives because that's not the MO of an English teacher. Going outside of your classroom, why would you do that? Do the job and that's it. That's what they're used to. Similarly, in Berlin, Germany, we developed missional leaders as they entered our creative community. So there you see a little bit of art on the walls. Again, if we're going to be a creative community, it means what? We have to do art. We have to be creative. <laughs> we have to live out those creative skills and giftings. And so we did this through creating podcasts, creating books, and hosting art events in the gallery space. If you haven't seen the table in the back already, we have some books that the Envision site in Berlin has published about the war in Ukraine by, uh, written by a believer in Kiev, the capital city. And it was an honor to get to work on that project for me specifically because we were supposed to go to Ukraine and then we couldn't. And so that in, in, in a small way was really kind of a way that God gave me some closure on that potential chapter. So uh, if anything, just go check out the book. It's a really cool, cool story. But once again, we knew that, to, that living lives like Jesus, questionable lives like Jesus, we needed to do something that the, an author and pastor, Michael Frost, he calls it living questionable lives. And, and so today, we're going to go to John chapter 1. If you have your Bibles, you can get there. We're gonna, we'll be there in just a second. Open them up. And we're going to talk about Philip and Nathaniel. And in verse 46 of chapter 1, Nathaniel says something like this. He goes, can anything good come from Nazareth? Referring to Jesus, right? This is this huge question that he has. Can anything good come from Nazareth? You see, opportunities of faith, for faith sharing, emerge from living these questionable lives. They emerge from questioning unbelievers, as they ask these questions. So, like Taiwan, like Berlin, we lived these questionable lives, and we're asking ourselves now, as our focus shifts to a new place, how do we do this? What might this look like? And so this is something I've been thinking about, pondering for this new location for Manchester, England. And I think as I do this, I wanted to extend the offer for you all as well. What does this look like to live a questionable life? We're going to Manchester because it's a city of 2.8 million people where only 36% of them identify as Christians. And we will again be looking to God to develop and identify missional leaders and to show us who to be pouring into and, and what to do and we'll be doing it in collaboration with the local church there, but, but still, this question remains when people ask us, well, what will be you be doing in Manchester? We say, well, we're not quite sure, but we do know how to live. We're going to be living questionable lives. And so the question is, what does that look like? One thing that maybe might not be immediately apparent about myself um, is that I was born in Taiwan, that country where my family first moved to back in 2015. You see, my parents were missionaries, and, and so we also lived in Europe as well. And so in total, I've spent about a fourth of my life in Europe and a fourth of my life, almost a fourth of my life in Taiwan. 
Yet to most people around in America, I think I can pass off as, as a pretty good Midwestern American, right? Perhaps. <laughs> and you know what? For much of my formative years, that was the goal. I desperately wanted to fit in. I, I returned back to the States from living with my parents at the age of 16. I finished out high school in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, not too far away from here. And standing out, being different, was something that I quickly realized came at a cost. It's not always comfortable. And so when I returned to America as a young adult, I decided I wanted to do everything I could not to stand out. <laughs> I didn't want to be different from my peers. I, I, I tried my hardest to fit in, and I did not want anybody questioning me. That was the opposite. Maybe you've experienced this. I'm not sure. Perhaps. Or perhaps you've lived in the same place for a really long time, and you fit in really well. You feel comfortable. No one's questioning you, and that's all right. Maybe that's what you're thinking today. I don't know. And I do want to be clear. I'm not asking anyone here to become a walking billboard or anything like that. That's not the goal. I'm not even saying that we all have to wear WWJD bracelets. Do you guys remember those? What would Jesus do? I wore one of those for a really long time. Yeah? It's okay if you do. But in today's influencer society, right, with social media, this type of living, it's already kind of seen as typical, right? We have people all around us trying to do those similar things. And I'm also not telling any of you to ostracize yourselves, right? Uh, I, I, you just don't remove yourself from the group. Don't remove yourself from the church for the sake of these questions. But many of us, we're stuck in this everyday normal routine that no one would ever question. I've been guilty of this too. And yet when you're a missionary overseas or a believer in your home culture and local church, we are actually called to live a life that invites these questions, questions from unbelievers about why we do what we do, how we do what we do. But don't, don't take my word for it. Let's dive into John chapter 1. We're going to be going from verse 43. The next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. Finding Philip, he said to him, follow me. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. Philip found Nathanael and told him, we have found the one Moses wrote about in the law. And about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nazareth? Can anything good come from there? Nathanael asked. Come and see, said Philip. Verse 47. When Jesus saw Nathanael approaching, he said to him, Here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit in whom there is nothing false, some translations say. How do you know me? Nathanael asked. Jesus answered, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree, before Philip called you. Then Nathanael declared, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. For the past couple weeks, I've been reading this passage over and over again. And each time I read it, I'm struck with awe at how much is happening in a simple exchange of words, right? We have two small dialogues here. And I think I've read this passage a dozens of times before. Uh, and until the last couple of weeks, it's always kind of felt a little vanilla. Perhaps that's because it's at the end of this amazing chapter. You know, John chapter 1 in the beginning has some really rich theology. It's, it's stuff to work through. And then you're kind of reading, and oftentimes I'll try to read through a chapter. I, don't, I like reading whole chapters. And so this one's like 50-some verses, and I'm getting to the end, and I'm like, okay, just give me the bullet points. What's, what's just happening here? But recently I started to study the exchange in this story, the exchange of words. Let me show you some of the things that, that I've picked out here. First, 
we see Jesus calling Philip, right, with a really simple call to action. What is it? Follow me, right? Follow me. And then we're told that Philip doesn't just follow Jesus, but instead he goes and he tells his friend Nathaniel. And Philip, he goes and he relays the situation, he relays what's going on to Nathaniel. And the Jews of those days, they'd heard of the Messiah, right? They knew all about the prophecy. They'd been waiting hundreds of years for what the Old Testament prophets had been saying of the Messiah. And in fact, prior to Jesus, there were other messiahs that had showed up, right? They had come and they had tried to do what Jesus was doing with force and and, and many of them ended up dead. (laughs) But this idea of a messiah coming to free the Israelites, to free the Jews, was not necessarily new. And so just because there was buzz around a man who the people were saying was the same man that the prophets talked about, it wasn't new, but, but Nazareth? Really? Here, this is the part of the story that Nathaniel is questioning. Nazareth was a small community that it wasn't adjacent to any other major cities. Saying someone was a Nazarene from Nazareth was similar to calling them maybe like a, a hillbilly or something like this. So even if that was true, it wasn't a kind response. It was very sarcastic in tone. And in response to this question that Nathaniel, you know, meant with a little bit of jest, right? Philip doesn't feel the need to explain further. What does he do? He does exactly what Jesus had done with him. Philip gives a simple call to action. He says, come and see. We could probably stop right here. <laughs> there, there's a lot to unpack in this, this one interaction. We could talk about it for a while. But the next dialogue between Nathaniel and Jesus, it's really too good to skip. You see, Jesus, he begins, he begins with a questionable statement. And without more context, There are a couple different ways we can kind of interpret what he says. Here, truly, is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. (laughs) Perhaps Jesus is being really straightforward. Of course, Jesus knew Nathaniel's heart, right? He's God, after all. And the author of this passage has just showed us previously with Philip that Nathaniel speaks what's on his mind, right? Nazareth, really? Right? And so perhaps Jesus knows Nathaniel's bluntness, and so he's commenting on how Nathaniel speaks his mind. Could be. Another alternative is to see that perhaps Jesus is using sarcasm, maybe a little bit of a play on words to make a joke. Do you guys ever imagine Jesus joking? Very rarely do I read through my Bible, and when I get to the red letters, think of it in a sarcastic tone. That could be what's happening right here. The Jews around Jesus, they would have quickly remembered that the Israelites, they get their name from Israel, right? Whom God named. And before that name, Israel, Israel was named, does anybody remember? Jacob, right? Jacob means leg puller. Just like our English definition back then, it it meant a similar meaning, right? Someone who pulls your leg is a, a liar, a trickster, a deceiver. And Jacob was a habitual liar. Jacob lied all the time to get the upper hand from his brother Esau. (laughs) And so just like Nathaniel made a really quick judgment statement about the people who come from Nazareth, right? Jesus' first interaction with this man is a witty, ironic judgment statement. But Jesus' joke points out, hey, we shouldn't judge a book by its cover. Or more precisely, judging a person based on simply where they're from is not the smartest thing to do. And in this opening remark, Jesus shows us how he engages people questionably. (laughs) I don't know about you, when I first meet someone, I don't necessarily open up with a sarcastic joke. That's risky. (laughs) That's how you burn bridges. 
But Jesus does it. He does it because he knows Nathaniel. And he proves that here. But Jesus knows his heart, and he knows how Nathaniel will respond. And, and sure enough, we see Jesus' statement inviting another question, right? Like, this doesn't turn Nathaniel away, but instead, Nathaniel goes, How do you know me? And from there on, Jesus shares just a small insight into his divine knowledge. Jesus knew exactly where Nathaniel had been even before Philip had approached him. Amazing. And Nathaniel thinks so too. That, that simple encounter was enough to launch Nathaniel into belief as the Holy Spirit revealed to him that Jesus truly is the Son of God. But he also recognizes Jesus' authority by calling him rabbi, teacher. Nathaniel also recognizes Jesus as his Lord by calling him the King of Israel. I really love, again, I love how much we can unpack from these two really short dialogues. There's, there's not a lot being said, but there are a lot of questions happening. I love how we can be just like Philip and call people to Jesus in a very simple way. In a study done by the Barna Group in 2019, said that three out of five Christian millennials believe that people today are, are more likely than in the past to take offense if they share their faith. Three out of five said that. Yet, at the same time, 96% of those same people believe that part of their faith means being a witness about Jesus. What's going on? So in a world of, of you do you and and don't criticize anyone's life choices and in a world of emotivism and, and feelings first, our culture makes a way of life. And how do we stay true to this conviction that we must witness about Christ? And I think we do see an answer here in Scripture. We must live a life in both word and deed that invites questions from unbelievers while remaining faithful to the Lord. And then, well, let the Holy Spirit work through that. A good chunk of our work with Envision is helping people recognize God's calling on their lives. But even more than this, we want to help our participants become more missional in the very culture and the country or context that they're being called to, okay? And to be clear, when I say missional, I mean the alerting people to the universal reign of God through Christ, making known that God is in control. He is sovereign through Christ, right? Well, you see, our mission, our mission and God's kingdom, they're linked. Perhaps that seems like a really duh statement, but I think it's worth repeating, we're called to proclaim Christ and what he means to the world, but in that same breath, we should be living lives that validate the claim that we've made that the kingdom of God has come. Mission is both the announcement and the demonstration of the reign of God through Christ. And so if we believe that, then there's a really big question that we can start asking us ourselves. How then shall we live? What kinds of rhythms, what kinds of patterns or, or habits have we created in order to demonstrate the kingdom to unbelievers? Right? Are they asking questions about how you live? Both, both Peter and Paul support this idea of living missional lives, and they actually anticipate that believers will be questioned. So Colossians 4, Paul writes in verse 2, devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. Verse 5, he goes on to say, be wise in the way you act toward outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace, 
seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. Similarly, in 1 Peter 3, we see, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against you, your good behavior in Christ, may be ashamed of their slander. When Brittany and I first moved to Berlin, the heart of eastern Germany, we began the work of getting our family settled. And, and often what that looks like is we got Kennedy into school. That was really important. Germans think school is like the most important thing in the world. So like I think it was in within two or three days of being there, she was in school. <laughs> and then we found a preschool for our daughter Haley. Um, and it was right around the corner of the office space that we'd be working out of. And you know, in our training prior to going overseas, one thing that we were taught was that babies and dogs create some really low-hanging fruit when it comes to talking to people and creating new relationships. I don't know about you, but, but most people have to comment on a dog when they see one walking around, right? Or, or they say, can I pet your dog? Same thing with babies. We all know babies are, are attention magnets, right? And Haley, our youngest, was two at the time, not quite a baby anymore, but she did make talking to other preschool parents really easy. And so Brittany, my wife, she saw this opening and immediately she started talking to the other preschool moms and scheduling uh, coffee visits and, and getting to know people. And the parents at Haley's preschool group uh, they had a, a chat group, a WhatsApp group, uh, where they all talked together and they discussed the latest preschooler news, you know, juicy stuff, of course, like whose kid hit who or where all that toilet paper was that we were all donating. It would always disappear. But again, seeing this opening, <laughs> Brittany decided to invite the entire group chat, all the parents, to an event that was being hosted at Envision Berlin's gallery space. You see, there was something called a Lego brunch being hosted by some other missionaries in our space. And um, it's really simple, actually, a Lego brunch. Has anyone ever heard of this? No? Okay. Let's put the two together. Legos and brunch. Boom. <laughs> it was really simple. Parents talk. <laughs> they get together. The kids are playing Legos. Parents talk. And then at a certain point, the kids... Um, would be invited to build Lego props in order to tell a Bible story. And a Bible story would be presented using those Legos. And since Envision Berlin space was not a church, it was a gallery, right? We wanted to make sure that the flyer was really clear, okay? We wanted to make sure people knew what was going to happen at this event. We weren't trying to perform any kind of bait and switch, <laughs> But after the second invitation that Brittany sent out to these parents, one of them replied with a question. It was very sarcastic in tone. He asked, are you part of a cult? Oh, whoa. Are you part of a cult? <laughs> Unfortunately, this question was posed in a way to really kind of intimidate Brittany. It was meant to scare the rest of the people in the group chat. And I don't think the person was really ask, actually asking a question. They were trying to kind of poke fun at what it was we were doing. But I can't think, I can't help but think uh, of this story when I read Peter's words, right? Brittany honestly did not know how to react to this because she knew the question wasn't serious, but it was mean-spirited, and so she kept her, her, her mouth shut. And just like Peter describes, Brittany was later told by a few of the preschool moms that, that this parent was, was way out of line. They shouldn't have acted like that. Right? Verse 16, so, so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. Several of the mothers stood up for Brittany. These are not believers, but they stood up for Brittany and ended up attending the event. And Brittany suddenly had made a few closer friends because of this Simple question. So what about our context? How do we live this out? Hopefully, I've made it clear that we're all called to this, right? This isn't, this isn't just people who go overseas. We're all called to live missionally. What does that look like practically? 
So I, I've got a few suggestions. So here's some, some ideas, right? The first one that I wrote up there is just choose three people to bless this week. There's a caveat, though. At least one of those people has to be an unbeliever. Yeah? That might look like different things. It could be words of affirmation, encouragement, perhaps acts of kindness. There's a bunch of snow out there. We could start shoveling. <laughs> perhaps it's even a gift giving. But I do want to, I, I want to make sure that as you bless people, make sure that they actually feel blessed, right? Like, like if I'm trying to hang up a painting and I need a hammer and I don't have a hammer, and you come over, you notice I need a hammer, but you say, hey, I've got this saw right here. You want this? It's a great gift. Well, that doesn't help me, does it? Right? That's not giving me strength. So be careful, because we can often have even bad intentions and disguise them as blessings for others. And that's a whole other teaching for a different time. <laughs> Number two, the second thing out there is eat with three people this week. And again, caveat, make sure one of them's an unbeliever. Why eat, you might ask? Well, it's because what, that's what Jesus did. What's the one thing that Jesus instructed his followers to do every single time that they meet? Eat. All right, Luke 22, Jesus took the bread, gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when we take care of people's physical needs through food, oftentimes it, it opens up this tremendous opportunity to open up our lives to unbelievers. And as they feel secure, as they feel safe, they open up to us as well. And we're able to have conversations just through food. In fact, Brittany and I, we've been reading different books and we noticed how in a couple of them, uh, the same person was referenced with the following quote, if every Christian household regularly invited a stranger or a poor person into their home for a meal once a week, we would literally change the world by eating. Sounds good to me. <laughs> I had the privilege, actually, of, of having a New Year's Eve meal with a family that uh, we knew in Berlin. And I had tried many times to get a hold of, of this man. Um, we'll call him Mark. <laughs> and Mark, he, he, was, he, was very, he was a busy man. And Brittany had gotten to know his wife through the preschool, and they had gone out to coffee. And, and very quickly, having heard some of the stories of what their home life was about, um, she said, Justin, you should really reach out to Mark. I think you would enjoy getting to know him and having coffee. And so I spent a good six months trying to get a hold of him. <laughs> Nothing, just blank. We invited them over uh, to eat with us for New Year's Eve, and they came, all the whole family. And the day after, Mark sent me a message and said, hey, we should go out for coffee. <laughs> Just like that. All it took was a meal. We went out to coffee, and he opened up to me about uh, the difficulties of living in Berlin and about what he was struggling with and, and how he saw the world going down a path that, that made him really scared. I was able to share with him where my hope came from. And again, this was because of a meal that we had the day before. The third habit I want to suggest, and perhaps even maybe the most important thing here, if you're going to do the first two, then make sure you're doing the last one as well, right? Choose a period of time to both listen to the Holy Spirit and learn more about Jesus. I think this should be fairly straightforward, but these are two crucial things to living a questionable life, right? By spending time listening to the Holy Spirit, we naturally become more Spirit-led, which will most likely lead to you doing things that don't always make sense to yourself and probably don't make a lot of sense to the culture around you either. And that's okay, because, right, the goal is to be living questionable lives while obeying the Father. And then, additionally, as we study Jesus, we become more Christ-like, right? So, so take some time this week to read the Word of God, study who Jesus is. Even just in these simple dialogues, we can see Jesus doing amazing things. How he talks to people, how he poses questions, how he answers. And then ask the Lord what he's doing in your life, 
and spend some more time listening. When we engage with these practices and, and we, when we make these things regular habits, we'll see unbelievers engaging with us in ways we haven't before. And as we share the kingdom of God missionally, we also recognize that we are indeed sent ones, right? You are missionaries right here. So together, as, as we move towards Manchester, England, uh, maybe perhaps like you, we aren't sure, again, we aren't sure what life will look like, but we know how we're called to live. And thankfully, the Lord has blessed us with partners. Once in Manchester, we'll be working alongside a local church of about uh, 2,000 people. It's a Chinese church. It's the largest one in the country. And these brothers and sisters at Manchester Alliance Church are asking similar questions about how they should live in their city. There's a big need, actually. There's a huge population of Hong Kongers who have fled to Manchester to, to get away from political persecution. And since 2020, over 130,000 of them have applied for visas to immigrate to England. It's the, Manchester's the second most popular place for them to go outside of London. And about out of those 130,000, it's, it's estimated that only 20% of them are believers. Tack on to that too, that, that Manchester, a city of 2.8 million, has 36% of its population that profess to be Christians. Actually, at, that identify as Christians. That's just saying, oh, yeah, I'm a Christian. It doesn't even necessarily mean that they attend church. 36% of the 2.8 million people in Manchester. And, and to add on to that starting, startling number, for, for the first time ever in England's history, less than 50% of the whole population of the UK identify as Christian. In fact, religion of all kinds is declining. And there's been another study that's been done and it says if, two, if there are two religious parents in the UK, they have a child, the parents are religious, they, uh, they go to church or they, they profess their faith in different ways, there's still only about a 50% chance that their child will, will take that faith on and make it their own. And so England is seeing the rise of the religious nuns, right? Not N-U-N-S, but N-O-N-E-S, right? People with no faith at all. And what's clear is that England, it's not necessarily what we'd call a typical unreached people group, but it's an unengaged people who are no longer questioning why and how they should live. So as you go forward with your week, or your month, and as you start to think about what it means to live missionally, I, I'd invite you to pray for us. Pray for Manchester as we begin this process of living missionally amongst the city's people. And, and we'll be praying for you too as you do this. Let me end with, with some prayer. Father, we love you so much. And we are so thankful for what you have done for us, Lord. Today, on Palm Sunday, as we think about, Lord, your ministry and, and, and what you were walking into, Lord, you knew exactly what was going to happen, and yet you still did it. Thank you, Lord. And I pray that, that together as your church, Lord, that we would be filled with your boldness as we live lives that evoke questions from unbelievers, as we listen to your Holy Spirit, Lord. Speak to us clearly. Father, you have been faithful to us in the past, and so we trust and we anticipate your faithfulness in the future as we move forward, as we partner with you, Lord. Thank you for working in and through us. We love you, Jesus. In your name we pray, amen.